Hello everybody, welcome back into the Color Gemstone Academy. My name is Paul DC, your instructor, and this is my YouTube channel, Paul DC Gemstones. This week's lesson, once again, is by subscriber request, and it's going to be about all of what we call the organic gemstones. Speaking of subscribers, if you haven't done so as of yet, please subscribe to the channel. It is absolutely free, but it does allow me to continue to do these videos for you. My goal is to make this the largest ongoing jewelry classroom for free for all of you until the end of time or until I die, whatever comes first. <laughs> anyway, let's talk about the organic gemstones. In fact, I wore my organic um, uh, bamboo shirt because it's so hot here in Florida that I wanted to cool off a little bit. Uh, but organic gemstones, as the name implies, it comes from a living organism whether that be an animal or plant matter. Now there's going to be some that you might think should be there that aren't. I'm gonna give you what are the most commonly accepted organic gemstones on the gemstone list. And I'll go somewhat in alphabetical order. So one would be amber. And this is an example of Baltic amber. You can see that right on your screen there. Uh, and then there's bone. I actually don't have an example with me, but I'll show you on screen what bone is. And that can be bone of any uh, type of animal. It's really popular in the southwestern part of the United States. Uh, then there is coral. And this is an example of a bracelet that has multiple gemstones, but you can see the heart there is a compressed and stabilized coral. Uh, that it would be considered an, an organic gemstone. Uh, then you have jet, and jet is a, a, a form of carbon that's like coal, but it is anthracite coal. It's a, it's a much harder version of coal. That would be considered an organic gemstone. Uh, pearl certainly needs no introduction. You know what pearls look like. I also think they're one of the most uh, versatile gemstones in the world. Uh, mother of Pearl, and uh, I'll show you an example of that a little bit later. Mother of Pearl is also a very important one. Uh, another very controversial one would be ivory. And we're going to talk to you about ivory and how trading, buying, or selling ivory is illegal in almost every country in the world, unless it's certain types of ivory. And we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. And then finally, and you know one of my absolute favorites, is shell. And this is an abalone shell, and I'll talk to you about some of the specifics. And it's not the only kind of shell jewelry that there is. We'll talk about that as we go along as well. Well, we're going to start with, uh, I think, one of the most interesting organic gemstones of all, and probably the oldest of all gemstones, and that is called amber. Now, I've showed you one example of, of, a, uh, of a pendant. This is another example of amber. Amber, also nicknamed gold from the north. And there are two main areas of the world where amber is harvested or mined. And one would be the Baltic Sea and all of the various countries that are around there. And you can see that on the map, all, all that uh, in different color is all the beaches where amber would uh, kind of float up on. Now, basically, amber uh, on the other area is uh, the Dominican Republic. Um, amber is literally tens of millions of years old. In fact, what it is, uh, years ago in the prehistoric times, the uh, tree sap would, would kind of uh, be the, the resin that comes out of the tree. And then over years and years and years, it would eventually harden, it become fossilized. And you get amber up for like from basically 35 to 70 million years old. And the interesting thing about the amber is the longer that it's in the ground, the harder it will become. Now, I say harder as a relative term because we know like quartz is a seven on the most scale of hardness. We know that uh, sapphires are nine, diamonds are 10. So with your amber, you're going to have a hardness of like two to two and a half. And that's going to become very important when we talk about something else that's often mistaken for amber. But um, it really is amazing because it is literally a window for looking at history of what was going on 70 million years ago. Now, why do I say that? One of the really 
popular collectibles in amber, Baltic or Dominican doesn't really matter, is going to be a piece of amber that might have a part of an insect or a scorpion or a mosquito inside of it. Because that is literally was living when that first sap came over it all of those millions and millions of years ago. And that's one of the reasons why I think a big surge in the popularity of Amber was around the time when the original movie Jurassic Park, it was also a book that became a movie, uh, came out because it was kind of showing you and it's, you know, there's everything that they do in these movies sometimes is steeped in a little bit of truth. But they were talking about how they were harvesting, a mosquito landed on a pterodactyl or another uh, ter ter uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex. And the blood that that mosquito was taking from that dinosaur uh, was trapped in that amber millions and millions of years ago. And they were theorizing you could then recreate the, the gen genetic code of those dinosaurs. Uh, so that, that part of that is really, really true, that they did capture these insects from millions of years ago before the dinosaurs went extinct. Now, have they been able to replicate a dinosaur's DNA and recreate it? No, but it was really steeped in truth. And that was really a lot of the, um, I think the popularity of that movie was Jurassic uh, Park. Now, it's been around for such a long time, in around 600 BC, there was a Greek scientist who discovered this mysterious power that amber had. And he said, if you rubbed it with a claw, it would actually attract light objects like a feather to that. And what that was is that was uh, basically the electrons in that, that you know, static electricity, we know that, and, and it kind of makes your hair stand up on its end. So amber has that power, so that this was some great mystical power. But that's another important thing to remember when we talk about something a little bit later on in that. Now, amber does come in a number of different colors. Mainly, we, we love it for that amber color. Uh, how are they harvesting it? There's another very interesting thing about amber to me. And that is, you know, when we talk about the specific gravity of a gemstone, and we said sapphires of four, you know, the quartz would be in the twos, two and a halves. Uh, amber has a specific gravity of 1.05 to 1.09. Now, why is that significant? Well, I told you that specific gravity or the heft of a gemstone is comparing it to an equal volume of water. Well, because it's only 1.05 and water is one, they have discovered that natural genuine amber will float in a solution of salt water because it is so close to the uh, specific gravity of water. Now that it tells you a little bit of how they find this in and around the Baltic Sea. First of all, if you look at the shorelines, because it floats in that salt water, it might wash up on shore and you can go through and pick and, and find some amber on the shores all along the Baltic Sea. You also might see occasionally people in the water with rakes. And what they're doing is they're disturbing the surface of the sand underneath. And of course, the amber will pop up and float to the, to the top. And then they can either scoop it up there or let it wash on the shore. So that is our first part of our organ organic gemstones, one of my favorites. And it is called amber. One final thought uh, before we leave the amber lesson is I wanted you to be aware of something else that is a resin gemstone that has become very popular lately, and that is copal, C-O-P-A-L. Now, copal is not millions of years old. It is thousands of years old. I know that's still pretty old, but it doesn't even compare to what amber is. And I first discovered this when I was at the Tucson Gem Show. And I went to this place that was selling a lot of amber and it was really, really inexpensive. And so of course my, uh, my antenna went off <laughs> saying what's going on here. Basically there's a younger form of, and it's not amber because uh, it hasn't fossilized at all. So it's softer, it doesn't have the same hardness. It's gonna be, I wanna say copal is one and a half on hardness, whereas we t already said amber was two to two and a half. 
So it's not going to be at all the same. It is, I still think, worthwhile if you're enjoying the look of amber and you can even get some insects that are trapped in that uh, copal. But it is really more comes from South American countries, what they call Mesoamerica. It is younger. It won't float in that sol solution of salt water. There's a couple of kind of tests that you can do. But I wanted you to be aware that there is something out there called copal and exactly the same as amber. Well, next up in our lineup of the organic gemstones would be bone. And bone would have been something maybe not as popular these days as some of the other more traditional organic gemstones like pearls. But it's something that was probably, even back to pre prehistoric times, people were wearing bone as ornamental jewelry. And even today you're going to see, you know, the, the cattle heads, the steer heads that are just the bones, the skulls that are used in ornamental uh, uh, uses. Uh, but also I've done a lot of uh, Native American Southwest jewelry where they even have taken uh, either a shell or a bone and they carved it into different uh, animals or they carve it into like arrows or carved it into a, 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 a feather, things like that. So I wanted you to be aware that that still again comes from a living organism at one time and that's why that will be part of our collection of what we call organic gemstones. Again, is it as popular? No, but I think it's something that you should be aware of and it's a relatively affordable organic gemstone. Okay, the next of our organic gemstones in alphabetical order is coral. And coral is a beautiful, beautiful gemstone and it's not without its somewhat controversial aspects because corals uh, are basically it's an organic gemstone formed by the skeletons of tiny sea animals called coral polyps. And actually the coral reefs in which they live are uh, basically sort of dead, you know, carbonate material that these polyps hide in from, from predators. But corals also form very important uh, functions in protecting our uh, coastal areas all over the world, not just here in the United States. Uh, and those of you that have ever either done scuba diving or, or maybe you've done snorkeling, you know that most of the habitat for coral, unless it's a dead coral colony, um, is protected. And they don't want you to touch anything. They don't want you to remove anything from that. And there's, I know, I think it might have been back in the Clinton years, I'm not sure, uh, where I think it was Clinton who made one of the largest national parks protecting the coral reefs outside of where um, uh, Hawaii is. I think that the thing that we need to know about coral, it can come in many different colors. So we've probably seen a lot of pink, we've seen a lot of red, you've seen a lot of uh, white, even blue, and that's a, called a, a, a pure calcium carbonate. And it can come in all of those colors. Now, much more rarely you will see coral in black, which is beautiful, and golden color. And it is made from a protein called conchiolin, which forms the basic structure of all shells that you see in the ocean floor. Now, where is it harvested? Well, it's harvested in warm tropical waters um, where temperatures are at least 68 degrees Fahrenheit or warmer. They don't grow as quickly or as effectively in much colder water, and which means also in deeper depths when the water is much, much uh, cooler. So um, the main predators, if you will, of, uh, of coral colonies would be pollution and overharvesting. Uh, there, it does have natural uh, predator. I think the, the king of thorns starfish or one of those things feeds on coral. Um, but Mediterranean Sea was at once a really, really big uh, producer. Pacific Ocean, including Japan, Hawaii, uh, Philippines, and uh, the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea. But there are a lot of efforts, and it is possible to responsibly source coral. But it is uh, one of those gems of the sea that I think is very, very beautiful, uh, relatively affordable. And the thing that I want you to know, there's kind of natural untreated coral. And then there's also, and I wanted to point this one out to you, 
that this is an example that became popular lately. Come in real close on that. That's a heart. That is what we call a uh, compressed, stabilized, and sometimes even dyed coral. But they're taking smaller bits of coral and they're compressing them together. And it's an affordable alternative uh, to coral if you're looking uh, for something like that. Next, we get into something perhaps even more controversial, and that would be ivory. Okay, so let's talk about ivory. Now, ivory has been around for obviously millions of years. Now, it's part of living animals today, like elephants, walrus, things of that nature. But it's also been around since the time of the woolly mammoth, uh, mastodons, uh, things of that nature. So, archaeologists in Europe have discovered ivory carvings and artifacts that date back 30,000 years ago. So, back in the time, in prehistoric times, when you had people living in caves and going out to hunt and hoping they get, didn't get taken away by the pterodactyls or the woolly mammoth, uh, there have been archaeological finds dating back that far. But make no mistake about it, and the world is practically unanimous on this, it is quite frankly illegal to buy and sell ivory with a couple of notable exceptions. So please be aware of that. If somebody's offering you ivory and it comes from a poacher, uh, elephant tusks, rhinoceros horns, whatever, you don't want to be caught doing that because you will, they will throw you in jail and lock, you know, throw you in jail, lock the door and throw away the key. Okay, now what are the exceptions? Well, first of all, if it is ivory from an extinct creature, like the mastodon that I mentioned, or the woolly mammoth, that is fair game. That is completely legal to trade in that ivory. Sounds like good news. Here's sort of the bad news. As always happens in the jewelry business, you might find some people that are not as reputable. And sometimes people will try and stain a new ivory and pass it off as something that is antique. Well, that's not necessarily true. And I would highly recommend you, get, you go to a reputable uh, dealer who might be able to test, you know, carbon test it to see that it is in, in fact legit. Um, so that's, that's my one cautionary tale. There's another thing that Judy and I described, and again, this is an example of a very, very old uh, ivory bracelet that was in Judy's family for generations and generations. We were at the Tucson Gem Show, and it was specifically the Jog Show. I want to say this is eight or ten years ago. Uh, and that's when we got these earrings. We happened upon a booth that was really close to my friend, um, uh, oh, drawing a blank, Silver, uh, Sunwest Silver, and um, Ernie Montoya. And there was this little booth, kind of in the hallway, that had ivory, all this ivory jewelry that was made out of old piano keys. And that's where this came from. So if you, uh, there was a guy, he bought a, a bunch of old discarded pianos, extracted all of the ivory piano keys from there, and he had a machine that could fashion it and make jewelry out of this piano key ivory. I thought it was brilliant. Uh, it was beautiful, relatively affordable. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't dirt cheap, but relatively affordable. So that would be another example if you, and I don't know if that guy's still in business, but man, oh man, that was a, a really, really great thing uh, to behold and see that um, incredible ivory. But again, be aware, it is illegal to buy and sell any ivory from any living animal of today. And that's what you need to know about ivory, the organic gemstone. All right, now it's time to talk about one of the organic gemstones, and I'm sure that most of you are probably already somewhat, if not very familiar with, and that would be the genuine cultured pearl, 
and the mother of pearl. Now, what is a pearl and how does it form? Pearl is formed when an irritant is introduced into a mollusk. Now, that could be something that happens naturally, like a grain of sand, or it could be happen like at a pearl farmer where they insert a little bit of soft tissue into that mollusk. And that becomes the basis of the nucleus, what will become the nucleus of a pearl. Because what that mollusk is doing is this thing that is irritating it, it secretes this substance that is called nacre. And over time, over years or months or years, um, it's going to form around that grain of sand or that soft tissue and become hopefully a round or nearly round pearl. And that is how a pearl is formed. Now, what about mother of pearl? Now, again, and you, you see these pearls, and, and, and you evaluate pearls a little bit differently than you do a lot of other gemstones. Pearls, it's about the luster. You know, I talk about the color gemstones. Color, color, color. The most important things about a color gemstone. By the way, what you find out is, here's another example. This is the mother of pearl. I wanted to see, see the white one right there in the top? That is mother of pearl. Now, what the heck is mother of pearl? Well, I talked about how that nacre that they secrete surrounds that grain of sand or that soft tissue that has been inserted and creates a pearl. Well, that same substance, nacre, spelled N-A-C-R-E, also lines the inside of the shell. And that's what's known as mother of pearl. It doesn't form on its own around an irritant, but you have what they can, it's extracted from a shell and they make beautiful jewelry out of mother of pearl, which is generally speaking, a lot more affordable than that strand of very fine uh, pearls. Now, what about pearl farming? Is that legit or does everything have to be sort of natural? No, it's perfectly accepted. Uh, and it depends on how warm the water is. It depends on conditions of the sea, because if there's a uh, tsunami, it can wipe out an, an entire you know, pearl harvest. But that is the way that most of the pearls you get come today. Now, there are others. There are exceptions. There are Tahitian pearls. There are some that are completely natural without being dyed. Golden pearls, pink pearls, the Tahitian kind of almost platinum pearls. And they can be quite, uh, quite expensive. But you needed to know what the pearl and the mother of pearl is. Now, that brings me to my last but not least of my uh, gems. All right, in my last but certainly not least category of our organic gemstones, we're going to talk about a shell. Now, a shell can be something as simple as a seashell that washes up on the shore that you use for ornamental purposes or hang it on to the end of a, uh, uh, a necklace or you see a string of little, tiny little conch shells that go the whole way around. There's a lot of ways to do that. But it also could be like something like a tortoise shell. This is a simple tortoise shell bracelet. Or my favorite, any of you that have watched me do some shows on the shopping channels, I love, I think one of the most underrated, underpriced gemstones is the abalone shell. For those of you that are old like me, you might remember in the 70s and the early 80s, they talked about the power shells, which came from places like Fiji and Hawaii and Australia. And that's what this abalone shell actually is. It is a mother of pearl that is from a mollusk that is known as a gastropoda. Gastropoda. And gastropoda is referred to by scientists haliotis. And haliotis means that it is the sea ear. And if you take a look at it, it's a single, it's a single uh, shell rather than like a clam that you know, opens and closes like this. So it's a simple uh, single shell that has these ear holes. That's why they call it the sea ear for, for breathing. Um, it is, I still think, one of the most underpriced, underrated gemstones on Earth. You can get beautiful big pieces that don't cost a lot of money. Now, again, it's a shell. So shell's not going to be as strong as some of your other, whether it's hardness or toughness, uh, gemstones like quartz. However, a lot of times you'll see abalone made and backed with either a black rock or a substance to kind of keep it more stable and less likely to break. 
But this is, I think, one of the true unsung heroes of the organic gemstones. And again, I love it. It's beautiful. It's underpriced. It gives you the look of almost like what would be a, almost like a lightning ridge black opal play of color. Or the last shell that I'm going to talk about is something called amylite. Now, amylite is a relatively new categorized gemstone. And it was, uh, again, it's, it's a little bit more expensive. It's a rare gemstone that formed from the fossilized remains of sea creatures, the ammonite shell that formed like 70 million years ago. And that was up in the western part of Canada in southern Alberta. And that's where most of the am ammonite shells, and they can be quite colorful, again, even more brilliant than the abalone, uh, and obviously a lot more expensive. It was first com uh, commercially mined in the 1970s, and it was around that time that it was accepted as a gemstone uh, for Canada. And uh, the one thing that you do need to know that I know that there's a couple of different manufacturers. The one that I knew of the years ago is called Corite International. And what they did is they took the shell and they um, covered it with uh, a clear quartz to, to protect that shell. So they backed the shell so that it wouldn't break. Then they put a cover on the top, so it's essentially a triplet. And that allowed you to wear that without worrying about it being damaged. And that in the quartz, actually, now that I think about it, I think it was a spinel uh, cap that they put on top of that, which was, which was even stronger. All right, one last thing before we leave our lesson here on our organic gemstones. Now, I know there's going to be some controversy, and some people are going to say, well, what about fossilized wood? What about uh, fossilized coral, things like that. The reason I don't categorize the, the, them as the same as an organic gemstone, like even the, there are, are gems that are formed in, over years in wood, like petrified wood is a great example of this. Petrified wood is where the wood is immersed in water. It starts to lose all of its um, structure of the wood but then it's leaving behind the building blocks of silicone dioxide, which we talked about in, in a previous lesson. So when you look at petrified wood, it's actually more of a chalcedony than it is. In other words, it doesn't have any resemblance to the chemical makeup that it had when it was a living organism. So that's why I, it's sort of a cautionary tale if you some a lot of people will lump some of those things in with organic gemstones i think if you stick with my original list you're going to be pretty good with what our organic gemstones are well i hope you enjoyed this lesson don't forget give me a thumbs up if you if you can if you have any comments or a lesson you would like to learn about share that with me i get back to almost all of those questions and suggestions and if you haven't yet done so, please subscribe. It really does help me out and it costs you not a red penny. So we're really getting more subscribers every week and I thank you. I really appreciate you for doing that. I'll see you next week when we drop our next video at 10 a.m. Eastern time on Saturday. Bye everybody.